Hi there, I'm John Walden and I'm here today to introduce the consultation, engagement and outreach component of the BIVA, the Belize Valley Archaeological Reconnaissance Ancient DNA Kinship Project. Before getting into the uh, presentation, I'd like to thank our hosts at Heritage Education Network Belize for putting on another wonderful culture symposium. It's a real pleasure to be part of the proceedings, so thank you. Today, I'm going to introduce um, our ADNA Kinship Project and talk a little bit about what is now possible using new genomic technologies in archaeology. Uh, I'm going to introduce some of our collaborators, many of whom you'll know well, I think. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, ethical ADNA consultation engagement work. I'm going to introduce descendant communities of Cairo District Belize talk about our ongoing consultation work with these communities, um, discuss our outreach materials that are put together before uh, finally wrapping up with uh, our plans moving forward. So welcome to the classic period Belize River Valley. Um, let's talk about classic Maya kinship, which is something we know uh, very, very little about, but we're on the cusp of learning a huge amount about. Anyway, uh, where to begin? So the Belize River Valley was split up into small kingdoms or polities. Each of, one, each of these was centered on a large polity capital, which had um, substantial monumental architecture, um, sites like Carpech, an associated royal court with kings and queens. Each of these was surrounded by a series of smaller secondary or intermediate noble uh, households. These are marked by the uh, little yellow triangles around the bigger red triangles. Now, around these were thousands of commoner households, so we have pretty high commoner populations in the Belize Valley. Um, these aren't marked on the map because there's just so many of them, you probably wouldn't see very much at all. Um, now, let's get into kinship. So, new uh, genetic technologies allow us to understand how the ancient individuals buried in all these sites were genetically related to one another. So we can begin to understand how the kings and queens, which we often find in the larger, sometimes looted pyramid structures, um, were related to uh, the remains of the commoner inhabitants of the smaller households in the valley, many of which ploughed. Um, so um, we can actually start to understand the relationships between these different parts of society. Um, so the first question is, how did these kinship or family practices vary between uh, people based on their status? Um, this is important. I mean, the Aztec Empire later on in Mesoamerica, we have uh, elite male polygyny. So where elite men had multiple wives, but commoner men didn't. So we might see variation in this way. We don't know yet, um, but it's entirely possible. The second question relates to kinship practices and how they vary based on the different polities. For instance, at Lower Dover, we have a big centralized core surrounded by a lot of fairly sizable secondary elite uh, complexes at places like Floral Park and BR 180. It's very uh, evident that these secondary elites could command quite a substantial amount of labor especially compared to the rulers at Lower Dover. The opposite tr is true at Baking Pot, however. We have a really massive civic ceremonial centre. Um, the rulers there, the kings and queens, could command a huge amount of labour. But in contrast, the secondary elites in the immediate periphery um, lived in pretty small diminutive houses and couldn't command a lot of labour. So these archaeological patterns um, allow us to generate possible expectations about how these kinship systems might operate, right? So at Lower Dover, we might expect um, some degree of power sharing and alliance building. So we might see um, royal marriages downward to the intermediate elites to consolidate power within the polity, um, to control frontiers, and also to govern a common subordinates. In contrast to Baking Pot, it seems that the royals are sufficiently powerful where they're probably not reliant on 
secondary regimes very much and might be marrying other royals at places like Karl Petch, for instance. We don't know this, but we can certainly test it. Right? Um, lastly, we can also look at how these practices changed over time. So, for instance, what were the kinship practices of the royals in these sites when they were emerging? Um, do we see them consolidating at home with inward marriages at first or outward at the regional scale? What happens when these polities rise to their apogees and then start to collapse? Do we see these royal kinship networks um, start to contract? Do we start to see um, royals marrying commoners? Who knows? Uh, so, to introduce our collaborators, um, I'm very fortunate to be part of the BVAR project. We have two Belizean directors. The project was founded by Dr. Jaime Arwe over 30 years ago. Uh, we also have a Belizean assistant director, Dr. Rafael Guerra. BVAR has a long history of outreach and engagement work, which you can read about in this Heritage Journal article by Dr. Judy Hogarth. Uh, Mr. Antonio Beardol has been uh, one of our outreach coordinators and has been a constant source of uh, positive input and inspiration throughout the process. Probably don't need to introduce Henby at this point, um, but the directors of Henby um, provided a lot of input and advice on how to structure uh, the events and the outreach that we're conducting. Um, we also have a collaboration with Cairo Tour Guides Association through their president, Dr. Rafael Guerra. I've given talks there previously and plan to do so as part of the outreach associated with this project. Mr. Frank Zib in uh, Oshmulkar, San Antonio Village, Belize, has been a fantastic collaborator. He really has been the boots on the ground, along with myself, for a lot of the engagement work I'll talk about in a minute. Lastly, bringing folks together has been made a lot easier by Mr. James Mesh of Oshmal Coffee, who's provided some great coffee, which is a good incentive for people to get together. Lastly, all of this has been possible with funding from the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology and the National Science Foundation. So the onus really is on archaeogeneticists now to conduct um, their own consultation engagement work with descendant communities. I've been following these guidelines laid out by Wagner at all 2020 about how to go about doing this. Um, we're basically up to about 0.4 now. Um, we've consulted with communities, we're including considerations, capacity building, and now we're really looking towards um, developing and managing data, uh, disseminating findings. Um, so we're at that stage. Uh, this is a bit of a new process to me. Uh, fortunately, um, Dr. Keith Prufer and uh, Dr. Doug Kennett, the second of whom is a co-author on this presentation today, uh, have provided a lot of advice and assistance on how to do this. Um, they've been doing it for a long time through their collaboration with Yashay Conservation Trust in Southern Belize. So to introduce the descendant Maya communities in Cairo, um, basically, the Maya make up 8% of the modern population of Cairo district, of which we have two groups, um, the Maya uh, or Yucatec speaking group in San Antonio, and then um, Mopan speaking Maya people in San Jose Sucuts. Now the plan in time is to target a broader swathe of the Belizean population, but to begin with, we really are focusing on the indigenous descendant communities of the classic period Maya we study. Um, both groups appeared in the area um, in the late 1800s, uh, although the difference between the Mopan Maya were here earlier, possibly at some point in the last thousand years, came back and forth because they were oppressed by the colonial British regime. Um, so um, today we've conducted one community consultation event in San Antonio, Oshmulkar, and the plan is to conduct a second at Sukuts um, later in the fall. Basically, the talk involves a 20 minute overview of the research with an open forum for discussion where people can raise points and an opportunity to distribute outreach materials. Um, following this, we have an IRB exempt um, questionnaire, which we use to um, carry out um, loosely structured interviews 
uh, each interview takes about an hour to two hours. Um, we basically, uh, Frank and myself, wander around the village talking to anyone who's interested in archaeology about the, the talk um, and the research at hand, and we get people's input into sort of research questions, how they want to be involved. We talk about how they want to learn about the results of the research um, and also address concerns about scientific study of human remains. The plan is to get a roughly 10% sample size of villages in both villages, and then ultimately publish all this data. Fortunate to have a range of outreach materials at our disposal. Um, my colleagues at the Max Planck Institute have put together a color, Adventures in Archaeological Science coloring book, which is available in a lot of languages. As part of this project, it's recently been translated into Mopan and Kekchi, and I expect to have it in most of the languages spoken in Belize in the next year or two. We've also been putting together short stories or archaeobiographies of the individuals included in the study. These are illustrated and are being distributed at the outreach events, but hopefully we plan to make, put together a book in the future. Um, we've also been doing translations of uh, academic materials and putting together materials for schools outreach. So moving forward. Um, longer term, the outreach and engagement to date has, uh, the engagement has provided us with a lot of ideas about what sort of outreach and dissemination of information people want and how they want to be included in the work. So, um, based on feedback from the questionnaires, we put together San Antonio Outreach Day, where we're hiring buses to transport um, villagers from San Antonio to Lower Dover in the Belize Valley, where I work, um, to... Uh, have a day out and be involved in actual archaeological excavation, have lunch, so on and so forth. There's also a call for annual village talks about the project. So for the duration of the project, I'm going to be going to San Antonio to talk about what we've discovered each year. Uh, we're going to do something similar in Sukkuts if, uh, if people um, decide they'd like that. Um, there's also been some call from other villages in the region for something similar. So I'm uh, going to start doing that. Um, been including a lot of undergraduates from various Belizean in, uh, institutions in field work for some time. Um, one of the things that's came out of the questionnaires is that we have a new generation of prospective Maya scholars who'd like to be incorporated into this. So one of the goals for next summer is to provide archaeological training for Mr. Frank Zib and some of his friends. And basically what the plan is, is to teach them excavation through to supervision, recording, planning, profiling, ceramic analysis, lithic analysis, the entire gamma up to first authoring a site report. Uh, there's also potential for them to design research and present research at conferences, and this money is included in our budget. Um, as part of this, uh, April Martinez of Hemby is doing an internship in museology at Harvard. So we've got some money coming in from all these different sources for this sort of capacity building. Um, Mr. Joshua Zib of San Antonio, um, this came out of the questionnaire process uh, when we were chatting with him, but he'd like to put together an archaeology documentary, which is something we're looking to do at Lower Dover next summer. Um, it also seems like people are very uh, keen to have app-based computer games, educational games about the ancient Maya, and this is something I'm putting together my friend Leslie, and I think probably we're going to end up with Frank involved in this as well. Um, We've also got funding for youth uh, football, uh, youth soccer sponsorship through uh, Max Planck. And we're going to be paying for um, putting together um, youth soccer shirts for teams in San Antonio and Sukuts. Uh, Beaver, Hemby sponsorship. I think Frank is also going to be designing these alongside myself, but um, that's currently a work in progress. We're also putting together an ADNA museum exhibit for the revamped Carl Petsch Museum, which I think will be happening in a few years' time. Anyway, a lot of plans. Well, thank you all very much uh, for watching and listening. Um, I'd like to say thank you to all the collaborators and all the folks whose hard work made everything possible. Thank you all very much once again.